Well, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce again uh, Dr. Uh, Matt Fujita from the University of Texas at Arlington to give his uh, second uh, seminar. Uh, he gave his first seminar uh, Monday to IB, and many of you, I trust, were there. I'll remind you, he did his undergraduate degree at UC Davis and majored in cell biology, uh, and uh, then came here for his PhD, where he worked with uh, Craig Moritz and Jim McGuire. Uh, from uh, here, he, he did a postdoc with Scott Edwards at Harvard and Chris Ponting at Oxford University, uh, and then joined the faculty at uh, University of Texas at Arlington in 2012, and he's, uh, he's been there as an assistant professor since then. He has uh, a large and active lab, a terrific record of funding. Uh, he's published many papers. He's interested in uh, squamate evolution and what that could tell us about genome evolution and conversely what genome evolution can tell us about biodiversity. So on Monday he talked a little bit about uh, genome evolution and today uh, I believe he's going to use genomes to tell us about the evolution of, of biodiversity. So please join me in, in welcoming again Matt Fujita. Thank you, Michael, for that introduction. I don't have to do like the first half of my uh, seminar now. But, um, it's great to be back, and I've now talked to a bunch of you, and uh, it's been, of course, this is one of the most exciting places for research, and it's just invigorated me. I can't wait to go and start research again once this is over. <laughs> um, but it, it's also nice to be in a very familiar place. Brunel's desk is still there. And, um, uh, and uh, yeah, I'm just great, grateful to be here to tell you what's what's happening in the lab and where we're going. Um, this is uh, Lithobates climatans. It's a frog that uh, was just sitting out in the open. This was in uh, some mountains, and it was around 80 to 90 degrees outside. Uh, and the reason why it's interesting is because this frog was out while um, we were having a frog vision retreat of PIs on this new grant that we had. <laughs> And it sort of exemplifies why we're interested in it, because it's out in the broad daylight, uh, and so we were wondering, what is it seeing, and uh, how is uh, light being interpreted by this frog? Um, now, the title of my talk today is Biodiversity and Natural History Research in the Genomics Era, and I think the title is a bit presumptuous, because I know that MDZ is a pioneer in this, and so I think I'm thinking of this talk as how the MDZ has influenced my research program, uh, since leaving uh, Berkeley. And so I've heard a few comments <laughs> about uh, how I look the same, but I just wanted to remind you what I looked like in 2000. <laughs> I have at least 10 more gray hairs since then. So, uh, but a lot has changed in nine years, and some of those include, uh, for my dissertation, I, it took me several years to collect nine nuclear introns, and now it takes maybe a few months to collect genomes. In fact, you can just send your tissue samples someplace in a few months, they'll send you a genome. Um, I used to be able to do my research with one gigabit <laughs> now I need terabytes. Um, I talked a lot about heteronodia, which is a gecko, which was my dissertation uh, organism. Um, and actually, this talk is very little heteronodia in it. So, uh, I'm glad Craig isn't here. <laughs> um, and as a grad student, I thought I knew everything. Like I left here and I felt intellectually invigorated, but now I feel like I don't know very much. And a lot of this is because my students are, you know, they're expanding my horizons. And um, it's just great to actually have a lab now where I can learn new things from my students. And so I showed this picture before, but my lab has two main themes. And one is using the biodiversity that we see in reptiles and amphibians to teach us something about genomics. And that's what I talked about on Monday with our research in parthenogenesis and, and um, I was going to say frog vision, but that's what's today, and genome structure. Today I'll be talking about how genomics can influence uh, our studies in biodiversity science. Um, and for a lot of us, I think it's the biodiversity that really motivates us uh, to learn about patterns in biodiversity, and genomics can have play a big role, and it is playing a big role in helping us do that. Uh, this frog is uh, Pseudophrynie coriaceae. We collected it just 
few days ago in Australia. It's one of the frogs that we targeted for our frog vision grant. And uh, we got there, we got to Australia, it was bone dry. It's one of the driest uh, seasons they've had in a decade. And so we were very uh, nervous because this was one of the targets, but they only come out during heavy rains. Luckily, they also call, and they call from underground, and so this frog was calling, and we were able to locate it and digging holes in the mud and everything. And luckily, we got the frog, and it's uh, now we you know a little bit about its eyes. Um, so I like to think of the lab as being fairly integrative in terms of how we approach our research. Uh, the main uh, theme is biodiversity genomics, and this is sort of how I define biodiversity genomics where we start with our organism. Uh, I don't have to tell people in the room here that the organism, we know the questions that we can ask based on the organism because we know the organism very well. Our questions are based in evolution and ecology and we use genomic approaches to learn something about the patterns of biodiversity in nature. And what are some of the things that we do in the lab and how do we approach our research? It starts in the field and it's important for me that my students uh, are exposed to field work because here we're justifying our research uh, using these animals. We think we know the best questions to address using these animals. For instance, for parthenogenesis, some of the only vertebrates that are parthenogenetic are squamates and so we can take advantage of those to look at genomes that are evolving asexually. And so, but we have to justify that. And in order to do that, I feel like we need to know the organism. And the only way to know the organism the best is to do field work and see them in nature. So it's important for me that my students actually do the field work and know the organism. And so these are just a few pictures of some of the field work that we've done. This uh, picture was last May, where we were in West Texas collecting whiptails for uh, microbiome research, which is what my uh, grad student Kathleen Curry is working on, and uh, genome evolution in these whiptail parthenogens, which my student Jose is working on. This was taken just a few days ago uh, when we were looking for frogs. That's not a frog, that's a broad tailed uh, gecko. <laughs> but um, we were catching frogs uh, actually at our host's house because uh, I guess when you're in Australia, you have lots of frogs in your yards, of course. <laughs> This is a gecko um, that I talked a little bit about last time. This is uh, the paternal ancestor of Lepidodactylus lugubris um, in, from French Polynesia, and this is me catching those geckos. <laughs> <laughs> so the field work is largely uh, the basis of a lot of our questions, because that's when we observe the animals, we uh, learn about what they're like and how they interact with the environment. But of course, um, a big component of the lab is genomics. And my lab, my research program wouldn't be what it is today without advances that have happened in the last few years, last week, yesterday, uh, in terms of collecting genomic data. So this picture was actually taken here in the EGL uh, many years ago. <laughs> um, but we've since then uh, gone from mostly using Sanger sequencing to almost exclusively using next-gen data now. We need powerful computers to analyze all of this stuff. So genomics is another core aspect of the research program. And of course, we, throughout my career, I've always been associated with the museum. And that continues today of the Amphibian Research Diversity, Amphibian and Reptile Diversity Research Center where we're continuing to use museum specimens and museum uh, approaches to study biodiversity. Um, this is just a, I have to mention heteronodia at least once. Uh, this is a series of heteronodia that uh, we collected in um, Central Australia. This is a new species, heter uh, the voucher, heteronodia fasciolatus. Um, we are starting to use CT scanning for a, a cool little project that we're doing in Texas. And so in Texas, uh, there are these two subspecies of um, earless lizards, Holbrichia lacerata. And we're trying to understand whether lacerata is a separate species from another uh, subspecies, subcaudalis. And it turns out morphologically, externally, uh, you can't really distinguish them. And so we're 
moving the CT scans. And this is just a CT. It's not this CT scan isn't of Lacerat, it's of Maculata. But UTA does have a CT scanner, and James McWil uh, Titus McWilliam <coughs> is uh, taking charge of that. Um, our collaborators are Corey Wilkie and my grad student, TJ Fernino. And so, like I said, Natural History Museums has been uh, sort of in the, the big motivation for um, a lot of my research, uh, perhaps simply because I've been associated with one throughout my education. Of course, I started here at the NVZ, and during the NVZ, I got to go on my first expedition uh, to Ghana with other NVZ students, uh, Adam Lache and Raul Diaz. Uh, got exposed to doing field work in um, Australia, collecting a bunch of heteronodia, and also it allowed me to think about how we can apply these animals to study genomes. And so this is a part of my dissertation looking at duplications in mitochondrial genomes that are in these heteronodia geckos. I then went on to the MCZ for my postdoc where we collected, continued to collect heteronodia and we described this new species, heteronodia fasciolatus. But this is also where I got interested in using reptiles to understand uh, reptile uh, genome structure. And then finally at the ARDRC, the Amphibian and Reptile Diversity Research Center at UTA, is when I started to think about the role of researchers in museums and what researchers can do to help uh, promote the value of collections in terms of collecting <coughs> specimens, what types of data can be associated with those specimens, just so that these specimens and specimen-based research has a broader impact on not just our own research programs, but a broader scientific community, but also to the broader public. And so just to recap, uh, the four little aspects of my research that I talked about on Monday. Um, one area that we work on, of course, is the systematics of reptiles and amphibians, and today I'll be talking about what we're doing in West and Central Africa. I'll also be talking about some of the work that we've just started, so I don't know very much about it, but things about frog vision systems. And yesterday, Monday, I talked about the evolution of genome structure as well as the genomic consequences of parthenogenesis um, in squamic lizards. And so today I'll be talking about these two things, again, how genomics can influence our research in biodiversity studies. And uh, Monday I talked about how genomes, how we can use biodiversity from reptiles and amphibians to understand things about genomes. So I'll first talk about how we're using genomes to understand diversity in uh, nature. And this sort of represents a more classical <coughs> aspect of biodiversity research in the lab. We're often interested in the patterns that we see in nature. And that's often the fun part that we get to, to experience is uh, learning something new, just the patterns. And then we have to apply for funding to learn about the processes. Um, this often starts with history, so understanding the history of organisms in nature, uh, and then using that history to understand the distributions of our organisms, and using a bunch of different techniques, a very integrative set of techniques, and it's just getting more integrative. That's just the nature of natural history research. Um, first, starting with field work, collecting the genetic data, using morphology, or understanding how morphology evolves. Um, looking at new tools such as physiology. I'll talk a little bit about this when I uh, mention um, some of the work we're doing with frog vision, but also behavior development, how microbial communities are influencing diversity, or vice versa, and of course ecology, to understand, provide a holistic uh, understanding of biodiversity in nature. <coughs> And so the project I want to talk about today is a collaborative project that's uh, sort of ending its, its funding uh, period, but uh, we're continuing to get tons of data for, and that's our work on the comparative phylogeography of West and Central African lizards and frogs. And this project started in the MVZ. It has, has its roots in the MVZ. It's a collaboration with Adam Lachey, who's at the University of uh, Washington, who was a grad student here with Jim Dwyer. Um, and we did a small expedition about a month in Ghana that was funded by the MBZ. And there were three of us, Adam, myself, 
Uh, Royal, this is the tree, who is our uh, very physically fit guide. <laughs> um, and it was a lot of fun. It was my first expedition. Uh, this is me with the Python Sebi Hyperoleus. This is a um, Amnirana albolabris, um, Hemidactylus mabuya, and Camellio senegalensis. Uh, it was fun to see all these things in nature. You usually see these things in the pet trade. Um, but the reason why we were interested in this area is because Western Central Africa has an extremely high endemism of frogs and <coughs> lizards, mostly frogs. So it's, it's one of the highest in the world. And so at the same time, uh, these forests, these rainforests, have experienced parallel environmental changes um, during Pleistocene uh, cycles. So in Europe and in North America, we experienced glaciation. In tropical areas, we saw reductions in distributions of forests and then expansions. And so we were wondering whether glacial cycles and this climatic cycling of environments had anything to do with the development of the biodiversity we see in reptiles and frogs. And so we wrote a grant and it was funded after three times, but uh, we finally got to do it. And we focused on three aspects, uh, which I'll talk about uh, today. Looking at the population genomics of several species, mostly frogs. Looking at the biodiversity dynamics, that is, the distribution changes of these uh, species. And then finally, something we're excited about, but we're just getting the data to do this, uh, doing a comparative phylogeographic survey of uh, the region. Okay, so this all started out uh, with a small project um, on the species delimitation of this forest gecko, Hemidactylus fasciatus, and there was some controversy about uh, our exercise. I think it's done its job in promoting discussion on how we do species delimitation. So I'm just going to jump over that uh, controversy and talk about the results. Um, the idea here was to take Hemidactylus, uh, which had, has lots of phenotypic variation, but at the same time it was difficult to identify whether that variation had any taxonomic implications, and so using genetic data to delimit species. Um, this is from a paper in 2014 where we followed up from the original paper of uh, species delimitation in this gecko using rad seq data, and we got the very similar results. Um, this method, which is called BFD star or base factors delimitation, takes in alternative hypotheses of species delimitation, ranks them based on um, essentially likelihood scores, and uh, you can pick the top one as your favorite one. Well, actually, it's not in order. Uh, the top one is actually this one right here, of five species, which is consistent with what we got before, and we did formally describe these correctly. Uh, later, um, <laughs> with appropriate names. Uh, some people don't like this name. <laughs> um, anyway, so this was sort of the start, mainly because we started to see a lot of breaks. So uh, this region right here is actually the Dahomey Gap, where we don't see um, rainforest the, these geckos, except in <coughs> pockets of rainforest in this Dahomey Gap. The Dahomey Gap is a stretch of savanna between two pockets of rainforest, which represent the guinea Congolian rainforest system. Um, also, we saw breaks here, which represents the Sanaga River. Um, and we were wondering, maybe this is a pattern that could be seen in other taxa. And so our grant really has two goals. The first goal includes a discovery phase. And that's simply taking the genetic data and determining what kind of diversity patterns we see, at least genetic diversity. And this is an example using Paramantis rufescens, a, a nest building frog, a cool little frog that builds nests, lays its eggs in the nest, and the tadpoles drop in the water. And these are data that uh, are fairly new, so uh, we haven't written this up yet, but uh, based on rad seq data, you see lots of structure uh, within uh, Paramantis. Um, the distribution and our sampling is pretty uh, accurate in terms of the collection of Paramantis rufescens. Um, and the structure is significant using several different methods, including uh, DAPC and structure. And finally, we can reconstruct the history of um, those populations. 
The next phase is understanding that pattern. And so this is hypothesis, the hypothesis-driven research part of um, the grant. And in Africa, especially, there have been essentially three main hypotheses out there as to how uh, you can get divergence. Uh, the first is the refugee model, that is, during these Pleistocene cycles, populations um, uh, collapse to particular refugia, and then uh, during period during the um, interglacials, they expanded back as a rainforest expanded. Um, the demographic uh, signature we expect to see is population divergence with restricted population size and then subsequent expansion of those populations. Another hypothesis that has been proposed is called the riverine barrier. So uh, there are a ton of rivers in West and Central Africa. Some of them are major. And the riverine barrier simply <coughs> posits that rivers have been important in divergence. Um, and it doesn't have to be rivers. It could be other types of uh, barriers, including mountaintops, uh, sky islands. But the demographic scenario we expect to see there is a period of isolation where there hasn't been changes in population size. And then there's a third hypothesis, which is the ecological, ecological gradients hypothesis, uh, which we didn't really test explicitly. And that's basically saying that divergence is <coughs> due to changes in environment. Uh, you basically get a climb. And normally, you have to have morphological data to uh, look at this uh, hypothesis. Uh, you'll see different morphologies between the two environments. But there is a uh, demographics um, signature you, you expect as well, and that's peripatric speciation with gene flow. Most of the genome will experience gene flow except for the few genes that are under selection. And so to do this, we wanted to do a comparative phylogeography to disentangle the commonalities uh, of uh, divergence among multiple organisms as well as the idiosyncratic uh, processes for each species complex. <coughs> and we originally proposed a bunch of different species. Some of these uh, we have done, some we plan to do, and some we're replacing with other uh, complexes. Um, but the molecular approach is dd uh, it, It's cheap and it's we found to be very useful. Um, using distribution data to try and infer potential refugia of our species complexes, and combining the genetic data, the di distribution data, to finally conduct comparative phylogeographic analyses, the tools of which haven't yet been developed, but uh, we're in the process of trying to develop those so that we can conduct our final super analysis to understand what the general environmental, uh, geological, and biological processes are for generating this high <laughs> endemicity in uh, Central and Western Africa. So I'd first like to start off by focusing on um, a very uh, uh, charismatic frog, a brown frog, uh, called the Gabon forest frog, Scotobus gabonicus. It's an arthroleptid that has its distribution from southern Nigeria through Gabon. Um, and it's a fairly small frog. It's about two inches uh, with, uh, in length. It exists in the lowland forest. It's a stream breeder. Um, Nobody really knows what the tadpole biology is of these frogs. And the analyses that I'll be talking about um, are largely, uh, I have to credit Dan Kordick, my um, postdoc, um, for really spearheading uh, these demographic analyses. So what are the patterns that we saw with scotobluffs? When we had the DD RADSEQ data, uh, we conducted a structure analysis across the whole data set. Um, and as often happens with Bradsey, depending on the divergence of the animals that you're looking at or taxa that you're looking at, um, some loci could be removed simply because of divergence, like the, the uh, stacks, which is the program that we use to assemble the loci, will often not be available for divergent taxa. So at first, we only found two major splits, or, or one major split. A southern group and a northern group split by the Sanaga River right here. Um, but what we, then, we then decided to just take each of these groups and then rerun stacks so that we could try to attempt to find finer structure. And we did, 
And for the southern group, we found three other groups. And for the northern, again, three groups. And interestingly enough, a lot of these splits are associated with rivers. So here's the Mbini River, um, which uh, splits right here. And then the Aguyi River, which splits right here. And the Cross River uh, right here, which uh, splits these blue and green uh, groups. So it kind of looks like the rivers are having an important influence on the divergence of these frog populations. Um, but it could be that uh, refugia are as well. And so to distinguish between those two scenarios, we again have these demographic expectations for the refugia uh, hypothesis. We do expect a period of expansion. And for the riverine barrier hypothesis, we don't expect so much of population expansion. Um, and so Dan, we decided to use um, the site frequency spectrum, and Dan produced these really nice user-friendly scripts that are available, if, if you guys are interested, to try and test alternative hypotheses using a program called DADI, which uses the, the two population, or up to three population <laughs> joint site frequency spectrum. Uh, and the site frequency spectrum is just an expected distribution of alleles in a population. So for instance, if you have an excess of rare alleles, that might be a signal of, uh, of an expansion. The joint site frequency spectrum combines populations, and so you can now ask questions about migration and gene flow. And so that's exactly what Dan did. And what you do is you simulate data under these demographic scenarios, alternative demographic scenarios, and then try to fit or find the best fit uh, scenario that uh, resembles your empirical data. And so what we did is we looked at several different comparisons. So uh, the demographics between southern and northern scotobleps, demographics between uh, two of the uh, northern populations as well as a special one we call the Cross River, which is interesting because it's at the head, headwaters of um, the Cross River where we see gene flow. And that's actually an expected um, uh, result because you expect more gene flow at the headwaters where frogs are uh, able to integrate with each other. Um, but invariably what we saw was that there was a period of expansion, or sorry, there was a period of isolation and changes in population size that resemble population expansion, which experienced gene flow. So what we think happened is these frogs, during the Pleistocene glaciation cycles, um, followed the rainforest as they contracted. And then after, during the interglacials, <coughs> expanded again with the rainforest and contacted each other uh, during that expansion and exchanged genes. <coughs> And so to visualize the gene flow uh, dynamics that could be happening, we used a program called um, EEMS to produce what's called the effective migration surface. Um, and this is what it looks like. It's a pretty picture. But what does it mean? So what this method does, it's the step, stepping stone model. It divides a map into small grids. And it produces models that tries to fit uh, migration routes and rates uh, to uh, match the genetic dissimilarity in the data. So wherever you see orange is where there's no gene or there's re reduced gene flow. And where you see blue is where populations tend to experience high gene flow. And so the map here and the size of the circles represent our sample size for those populations. And so the cool thing about this map here is we see lots of diversity here simply because there's barriers to gene flow, yet lots of populations. Um, a barrier here to gene flow, which represents the Sanaga River. A uh, barrier maybe here, the Mbini River, and then the Aguidi River. So it makes sense that these rivers are playing an important role in keeping these populations distinct but we also feel that uh, the refugee model, refugee model has had an important um, influence in initially starting that divergence. And so if the refugee model uh, were correct, then we can try and identify those uh, refugia. 
And so my student, Danielle Rivera, who's a GIS whiz, um, took the distributions of scotobleps and uh, predicted the distributions of scotobleps back in time, at 6,000 years, 21,000 years, so representing the mid-Holocene, the last glacial maximum, and then the last interglacial at around 120,000 years, and found that certain regions, this is actually outside the, the distribution of scotobleps, certain regions that look like they could have been refugia, so one here, one here, and then one here, which represents uh, what we call the Cameroon, Cameroonian volcanic line, a mountainous area in Cameroon, um, which closely resembles some of the other uh, refugia that have been proposed in the past. But these refugia, these hypothesized refugia uh, from the literature, have been actually, they're based on genetic diversity. So I think these are the first refugia they, um, uh, in the region based on these frog distributions that have been proposed, but they are very similar to some of these other refugia that have been proposed. And so, and they match exactly <coughs> where the genetic diversity is. And so just to summarize, scotobleps and um, some of the dynamics that we see in scotobleps, um, it's distributed across West and Central Africa. Rivers have played an important role in the divergence, but we think the start of that divergence was caused by these uh, glacial cycles and the contraction of um, the distributions to particular refugia. The dates, so this is a tree that we uh, built using our SNP data, correspond to Pleistocene divergence, which is consistent with our refugia hypothesis, um, and the demographic models that we conducted. And then, now I want to quickly switch to another frog, Afritzalis paradorsalis. Um, this, is, this was a project headed by Dan Portick and Raina Bell, and uh, was led by an undergrad at the MBZ, <coughs> Kristen Charles, and we just submitted this paper to the Journal of Biogeography a few weeks ago, and again, this frog is has a very similar distribution to scotobleps, but it has a very different ecology. It's a tree frog, um, and it's nocturnal, and uh, we have good sampling across the distribution. Um, we found very similar breaks in a Fritzlis. I'm sorry these are so small, but I needed to fit in all the data I could. Um, <laughs> we had a northern group and a southern group, and the northern group we could um, detect additional structure in. Uh, the interesting about this study is there is a Sky Island population um, that looked like it, or it is genetically diverse. Um, this is uh, a subspecies, Manangubensis. And um, interestingly enough, the mountain uh, also harbors distinct lineages from other frogs and other taxa. And so, based on the genetic divergence, as well as uh, phenotypes and morphological data, these things are a bit smaller than the uh, main subspecies, or the other subspecies, or the Rosales. Uh, we've also described it as a new species, or elevated it to a new species. Um, but the important thing here is the patterns resemble what we saw in Scotobleps. So we did the demographic models. The main models that seem to be <coughs> driving the diversity in Afrixilis is, again, contraction to refugia and then expansion, <laughs> with rivers playing an important role from these populations merging back together again. So the break between this um, southern and northern group is again the Sanaga River. We also looked at EEMS, and even though these pictures look different, they're actually <coughs> very similar to each other with breaks uh, that look like the Sanaga River here, this is the CVL, the Cameroonic Volcanic Line, which is where the, uh, the divergent population is, the Manangubensis, as well as the Aguilla River, which is very similar to Scotobleps. We also found divergence with Bioko Island, um, but it does seem like there's gene flow with Bioko and the mainland population. And so now we have these two taxa. We have many more in the pipeline. What do we do next? We want to conduct a comparative phylogeography to try to understand the general uh, patterns of divergence in the region and whether these could have contributed to the great uh, diversity we see in these frogs. And we want to do comparative phylogeography using our SNP data, which are just 
starting to come, these tools are just starting to be developed. Um, one that's already available is using SNP data for co-expansion. And uh, Michael Hickerson and his previous grad student, uh, Xander Jue, have developed this method uh, using what's called the aggregate site frequency spectrum. It's in an ABC framework. Um, and basically what you do is you simulate data under s different demographic models. You summarize those data. Uh, you look at how those data compare to your empirical data and uh, essentially <laughs> pick the best scenario that matches your empirical data. And the idea here is to look at co-expansion. So have different populations from different species co-expanded with each other. And in our case, did populations of Phryxilis and of Scotobleps co-expand? Did they expand at the same time? Indicating that perhaps refugia were in fact important. Or did they expand at different times, which may, means a different demographic scenario, of course, for the different frogs. So this, for instance, represents co-expansion of multiple species at the same time, and this scenario represents multiple different co-expansions. So what did we find? This is sort of a, a messy slide, but we looked at Scotobleps, we looked at Afrixilis, and we looked at Paramanthus, which I talked about briefly. Each of these circles up here in the top panel represent the populations that we looked at, and down here are the results <laughs> where the different colors correspond to co-expansion. So all the populations in green have co-expanded, and all the populations in brown have co-expanded across our three species. Now, what this means, we not sure, we're not sure. Uh, we're still interpreting what these patterns are. Uh, but additional tools that we're interested in using and developing are also co-divergence. So that's something that ABC methods have been very popular in uh, for doing comparative phylogeography using Sanger sequencing data using a few loci, but they haven't yet been developed uh, using this aggregate site frequency spectrum yet uh, that Xander and, and Mike are, are using. And so we're interested in using um, and developing those tools. Other frogs, uh, systems that we're looking at include Kangrawa, Alani, and uh, Deruri, uh, Amnirana, Albalabris, and this is all with collaborators. Um, so this project would not have been possible without our collaborators and their sampling, and their good sampling. Um, we also have a few reptiles, a gamma, hemidactylus, and some crocodiles. And so all of these data sets are finally coming together and we're working with Mike and um, Xander to develop the comparative aspect of our, of our uh, project. And so that's what I wanted to talk about on the West Africa, West and Central Africa project. Uh, again, it was funded a few years ago and we're getting all this data and it's getting kind of ridiculous on how to store it and analyze it, but it's also been a lot of fun. Thinking, also thinking about where we're going in the future, where we can focus in uh, for based on what we, the patterns we see, where are the most interesting areas to focus in. Um, the islands that Raynar is studying, for instance, is a, is a great uh, place to understand island biogeography in the region. Um, but other projects in the lab that have to do with using genomics for biodiversity, we're still working on heteronodia. My student, uh, James McWillan, is looking at hybrid zones in heteronodia. We are developing a system uh, uh, comparative system in Texas, looking at the phylogeography of multiple taxa, so including Crowgaster augusti, the barking frog. I've talked briefly about Fabricia, and my uh, previous student who just graduated uh, looked at uh, Mastocopus, the whip snakes. A few of my students are interested in toad systematics. TJ is interested in Encilius in Central America, and in particular, we're wondering if bupotoxin might play a role in the diversity in these toads. My student Danielle is interested in comparative phylogeography in Brazil. And uh, one aspect of her research is she's looking at these skinks, Mabuya skinks, that have placenta and what the evolution of that placenta might be in these skinks. <coughs> and so just to remind you what the four things are, because I want to jump into the frog vision systems, um, which is the second part of how we're using genomics to understand biodiversity. And oftentimes, while many of us are looking to use genomics to understand 
what we see in nature, sometimes we know that frog, uh, some systems are really biodiverse, like frogs. We know frogs live in <coughs> multiple different environments. We've seen them in the field. We know that burrowing frogs sometimes have very small eyes. Tree frogs have big eyes. Some are nocturnal, some are diurnal. And so we know that there is organismal diversity. And sometimes we want to understand the functional basis of that diversity. And so this is why Reina, Jeff Stryker, and I thought of uh, looking at frog vision um, and the evolution of frog vision because we thought frogs are an excellent model to look at how vision might change as frogs evolve to inhabit different environments or uh, life histories. And so this is sort of our project. I'm really proud of this picture because I drew this uh, on my iPad and using a watercoloring program. Um, it's, I think, a pretty integrative project. We're taking data from multiple sources, including spectral data, uh, sequencing, as well as morphology, and trying to infer um, how vision is important in understanding dichromatism, fossil reality, as well as uh, life history of and as I mentioned, this is a really uh, good collaboration between multiple institutions, multiple museums. So we're collaborating with Jeff Stryker, who's a co-PI on the grant, uh, David Gower, and they are heading uh, the, the, the uh, British side of the project. So this is co-sponsored by NSF and NERC. So they have a bunch of money to look at, uh, do, do morphology as well as field work in uh, Central America. Here I am. And here's Reina. This was taken during our PI retreat in Washington, D.C. And this picture is the only picture I have of uh, Dr. Ellis Lowe, who is, uh, I don't know, he builds these machines to look at the microspectrophotometry of individual cells in the eyes. So there are a few other machines out there, but he's the only one that builds them and fixes them if <laughs> they break. So we actually bring him everywhere. Uh, we brought him to Australia, <laughs> Rainer brought him to Gabon, um, and his machines are portable, so he just takes them along. Uh, in Australia, we had to set him up in the bathroom because you need complete darkness. And so this is a picture of him doing his work in complete darkness, except with the red light, of course, um, collecting the MSP data of our frogs. And so we had two specific aims. One was to integrate uh, physiological, genomic, and uh, morphological approaches to understand broad patterns in vision uh, in frogs across the frog tree of life. And we're essentially at this stage right now. We're, we're sampling um, 90 species of frogs that uh, represent these families and multiple different life history traits, uh, diurnal or nocturnal, different habitats, whether or not there are tadpoles, and whether or not there's dichromatism. <coughs> Our second aim is actually a bunch of different aims. It's testing hypotheses of adaptive vision evolution uh, in a comparative framework. <coughs> and the approaches we're going to use include um, a lot of the sequencing of opsin genes and phototransduction genes. Um, and different systems. So Reina is very interested in looking at dichromatism. Uh, Jeff is very interested in looking at fossoriality and how, the vis how vision, how eyes have evolved and adapted to these different life history strategies. The approaches we're doing include lots of field work in cool places. So Reina just went to Gabon in December, collected a bunch of different uh, frog eye data. We just went to Australia. Here I am taking spectral data of the uh, frog itself. Uh, we're going to use genomics to sequence opsins as well as phototransduction genes. The idea there is to see whether or not certain genes have become non-functional, whether they're expressed, overexpressed, um, whether there's been nucleotide changes or, or amino acid changes that can spectrally tune uh, particular opsins. And then we're going to look at the morphology of the eye to see how that has changed based on life history strategies. And so when um, looking at the genomics, we're interested to see how protein, the opsins have changed that could uh, tune these opsins to 
uh, see different colors or see different wavelengths. These are preliminary data from some frogs that Reina Hital, and these are two Hyperolea species that exhibit dichromatism. And this tree uh, represents the opsin genes that we collected from uh, transcriptomes from the <coughs> eyes of these frogs. So uh, Reina sequenced males and females from each of these two species. And already it's very interesting because we're confirming a lot of what people have hypothesized in frog eyes. One is that frogs are missing an important opsin, Rh2, which is uh, expressed in a lot of cones. Um, we've also saw potentially elevated evolution, so this is a tree and the branches are colored based on um, rates of evolution, uh, potentially accelerated evolution in, in Rhodopsin 1. Um, and orthologs and all of the other cone opsins, um, which means that potentially these frogs see color, uh, these are nocturnal as well, so they're seeing color at nighttime. We're interested in uh, the morphological evolution of these eyes. Uh, so these are, this is a plot of body size and law, uh, eye diameter of a bunch of different frogs. These are what we call typical uh, eye size and as well um, frogs with reduced eyes, including the microhylids, the myobatrachids, uh, rhinophrynids, and pipids. And especially with the fossorial frogs, uh, you do see a trend in uh, body size and eye size, but some of these have eyes that almost appear normal. Uh, other frogs like Scaphiopus are also burrowing, but they have big eyes. And so one difference is that Gastrophryni here in microhylid digs head first Scaphiopus digs uh, hind leg or uh, bottom first. <laughs> um, and so maybe that has something to do with the biology of the eye. And two other questions that we're interested in include dichromatism in hyperolea. So Raina is very <coughs> interested to see, uh, one, what is the spectral data in these frogs' eyes, but also how is the molecular evolution um, <coughs> affecting vision in these uh, hyperoleas. Are there gene duplications or some opsins overexpressed? Um, have the, has there been amino acid changes to uh, find uh, to tune the opsins to see uh, distinguish colors easily? And then, of course, the same thing in fossorial frogs. How has the molecular evolution affected the vision of these frogs? Have there been uh, non-functionalization mutations? Uh, because presumably these things don't need to see color, so they don't need the color opsins anymore. Um, or have there also been any type of amino acid changes? So we're not there yet. We don't yet have uh, the, the probes for the exon capture. Uh, we're still in what I call the natural history phase. We're just observing the patterns and observing uh, some of the cool things that um, we hope to find. We're already finding cool things. So. In Gabon, Reina found out that a lot of these frogs have um, oil droplets, which are normally also found in birds. But in Australia, we don't really see a lot of oil droplets. Um, frogs also have two different types of rods, and we are finding that they have different uh, spectral properties in these uh, EIs. And so we're very excited to see what we find out. I'm sorry I don't have any more results for you, but uh, maybe in a year or two, uh, I can come back and give another MVZ seminar. So I hope I've convinced you that these systems are exciting, that um, the systems are ideal for addressing some of the questions uh, of biodiversity in West and Central Africa, as well as vision evolution. And uh, we hope to continue using an integrative approach to address uh, fundamental issues in biodiversity. So, Thank you very much. Hey, if somebody could get the lights, we'll give folks who need to leave a chance to get out and then find the reflection. Thank you. Mohammed. Um, and existing in the genome. Uh, so for uh, some of the burrowing frogs, for instance, uh, they may have reduced eyes, but they also have tadpoles that could be diurnal. So we expect um, the phototransduction genes to be conserved, uh, more conserved than the opposite.
Go ahead, you can call me. Okay. I'm a bunch of hands. <laughs> Matt, I'm a bit confused about the temporal sequence of the refuges versus rivers, because the rivers had to have been there long before the refuges were generated. Yeah. And so that rivering effect should be a deep history effect, and then the current demography is a yeah. result of, <coughs> of uh, expansion and contraction on both sides of those rivers and with the effect of the, of the, uh, of the uh, refuges. Yeah, right? yeah, that, that's very true. And for the Sanaga River especially, we think it's been pretty stable throughout the Pleistocene. Yeah. We don't think the flow has changed um, based on um, uh, uh, deposits in the ocean and as well as dating and, and fish. Uh, divergent state of fish uh, in, in the Sanaga River. Um, so yes, yes. So what you're really saying is that the rivers, to, I mean, in that in your scenario, are just simply the meeting point of expanding from refuges. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But and we they don't, don't have any effect other than preventing. That. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so follow up on that. So they could the frogs. Could be uh, moving genes across these uh, so-called river barriers, based on what. Also, that curious observation you had some oceanic islands, and you said there's no uh, inhibition, or at least there is a gene flow to the mainland. Yeah, yeah. Now you'll you'll probably hear more about that when Raina comes in a few weeks, because um, uh, she that's her research program. Um, but yes, we did see some gene flow across rivers, especially in, in the cross river in the Cross River um, at the headwaters, where there's mitochondrial haplotypes uh, from one clade, but nuclear backgrounds from another group. Um, so there's definitely strong um, gene flow where you expect to see it, that is, frogs are, can um, cross the headwaters a lot easier. Representing by sort of newness and fish. Because <laughs> fish and fish and rape and fish and birds, some birds certainly can. I assume I don't know about lizards. Some lizards can. Yeah. So it's an you know it's just an interesting question about oh. whether. And then I guess I was, I was going to ask related, maybe totally unrelated. There was a really controversial but interesting study in iris shape in vertebrates, and I noticed in your one of your slides that some of those frogs had. Um, I guess iris shapes that were sort of spindle shaped and yeah. others are round. So is there is there a relationship with where they sit in a trophic? Um, you know, if you measured stable isotopes from them, would you be able to predict their eye shape? Because you can, you might be able to in, in some vertebrates, right? Yeah, I, I'm not sure. We are a reporting pupil shape though in, in our specimens, oh, um, and we do often see that pupil shape is. Um, is similar in closely related frogs. So frogs in, uh, in uh, myopatrachidae are often the same versus, yeah. Uh, so, but there are three general shapes that we see, vertical, uh, horizontal, and circular. Um, that, that, yeah. So we're recording that data. Um, how we're going to interpret it or analyze it, we're not sure. Yeah. <coughs> Underground frogs, these professorial guys. Um, what do they use the vision for <coughs> at, at all? I mean, do they do they when they must come out of, out of the ground sometimes to find other underground frogs to, to woo or something? Yeah. What um, <laughs> do they use their eyes at that moment or? Um, that's a good question. I imagine they need to use their eyes to find prey uh, and um, underground. Yeah, yeah. I mean, some of these they're they're not necessarily uh, just stuck in. The they're, they're in burrows, for instance, uh -huh. um, um, and they do have to come up. Not quite sure if they, they use eyes for finding mates. Um, uh, one of the hypotheses as to why some of these burrowing frogs are have small eyes is because uh, they have to dig head first, and so it reduces 
potential for injury on the frogs mm -hmm. or infection in the frogs uh, versus scaphiopus, which have huge eyes and they dig backwards. Um, yeah, and and a lot of these are a lot of the burrowing ones are not dichromatic. I was in intrigued by the fact that you found the Pleistocene refugia and that the timing of divergence corresponded nicely to the, the, the Pleistocene. So one question was, do you see other unrelated groups of organisms that identify those same refugia? Do you see that for mammals or, or birds or insects? Yeah, so a lot of the literature um, is actually on plants. And so a lot of the proposed refugia are based on plant uh, diversity in the region. And that's where we... Uh, uh, mostly identified those alternative refu or similar refugia that we found in scotoforms. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, in, in plants there have uh, been a lot of studies on potential refugia. So the other question is, and, and people like Jim Patton know much more about this than me, but 20 years ago there was a lot of excitement at looking for Pleistocene refugia in the Neotropics. And, uh, and in many cases, it, it turns out, I mean, first they were difficult to find, and divergence times predated the Pleistocene by, by a lot. I, I don't know if I'm bundling this, or, but can you speak to that discrepancy between what, what you found and, and you know, efforts to, to find similar patterns in the neotropics and why they might be different? Yeah. Or you know, correct me if I'm, if I'm describing the situation with, if, if wrong. No, you, um, so the refugia we inferred, we didn't actually identify when those refugia occurred. Uh, we just looked for the stability of distributions through time and uh, where those, where the scotoblefts could be during uh, potential glacial cycles. So um, when the refugia were actually around, um, we, uh, the best we could do um, I think we're just using the divergence times of the populations. So we haven't actually looked at whether there's been a discrepancy in divergence with the genetic data and the proposed timing of the refugia that we... So the heard. divergence between populations... You, you haven't looked at the divergence between populations? Is that... No, well, um, I, we have, but not the timing of the, the ref refugia. So we're assuming that the divergence of populations correspond, like we haven't looked at the discrepancies. But the divergence between populations corresponds in many cases to Pleistocene. Pleistocene time periods. Interglacial periods. Yeah. yeah. Um, but in, in the Neotropics, when one looks at, you know, divergence between populations that initially were thought to be due to Pleistocene events, they turn out to predate that by, by a lot. Okay. And, and I was just going to say, I mean, the bigger issue is what is the actual empirical evidence for refuges in the first place? And at least in the Neotropics, what I remember of the older literature is there is not. If you look at column profiles and so forth, there's no evidence of expansion of savannas, which is the basis for the retraction of the rainforest. Just a, a change in rainforest plants, uh, the tree structure. And so, so that question is, you know, relates to Africa, what is that empirical evidence, or is there any empirical evidence that rainforests actually retracted and, and savannas replaced them? Yeah, yeah. No, that's a good question. I, I something I, I should look into. Um, I don't know if Rory, if you know of literature. I mean, there's lots of polling core <laughs> data that very clearly shows that forests retracted and savanna expanded. Yeah, but that's not true Africa is very, very different to the Neotropics. There's yeah. no doubt there were Pleistocene in the future, and there's no doubt that they expanded and contracted many times. But I mean, is that based on the pollen record? It's based or, on the pollen record. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah. But my, my question wasn't about yeah. all of yeah. Africa versus. It's about, you know. But every tropical <laughs> forests versus, you know, Congo River Basin forests. Or but most of most of the people who focused on refuges have done it, you know, in a circular way. You know, they've seen localized, you know, phylogeographic structure and assume that that's result from contraction of, of habitat. And then when you go to look for the empirical evidence of that contraction of the habitat, you don't ordinarily find it. Is, is there a big elevational difference between the areas where you're inferring there's no gene flow and the areas where you're inferring gene no, flow? No, so for a lot of the uh, species we're looking at, they're lowland forest um, 
except for a fruitless work which has that uh, the Sky Island species. Other questions? Well, Matt, you've survived two days.